everybody. Thank you so much for coming out today. My name is Rebecca Sappel, and I'm the Director of Programs at the Elizabeth A. Sackler Foundation. So I work with Elizabeth just to give additional programming support to the wonderful staff here at the Sackler Center for Feminist Art. And I'm so delighted that you are all here to help me welcome Barbara Nesson for her artist talk. <laughs> Center for Feminist Art has continued to fulfill its commitment to the past, present, and future of feminist art using its award-winning exhibition and education spaces. The Sackler Center strives to raise awareness of feminism's cultural contributions. Dialogue and debate about feminist art, theory, and activism take place in the Sackler Center Forum here, and groundbreaking exhibitions are held in its feminist art and her story galleries. Currently, these galleries feature Twice Militant, Lorraine Hansberry's Letters to the Latter in the Her Story Gallery, and also uh, in the Feminist Art Galleries, we have Wangechi Mutu, A Fantastic Journey. Both exhibitions have been lauded by the New York Times, and both are deserving of your time, so I hope you will um, visit these two shows if you haven't already seen them. Um, just a few quick notes about the flurry of activity that's happening here at the Sackler Center this spring. Really exciting. Um, like I said a moment ago, it's our seventh anniversary, which is very exciting for all of us here. Um, we put together a series of public programs, um, actually specifically planned by Elizabeth Sackler, around criminal justice reform. These are taking place on March 15th, March 29th, and April 3rd. And the series is called States of Denial, the Illegal Incarceration of Women, Children, and People of Color. Um, the first program will feature a panel discussion led by Piper Kerman, who, if you don't know, she's the author of Orange is the New Black, and three other women who were radicalized um, while they spent time in prison and have become activists for change and reform. We'll also have a panel on March 29th um, called Mass Incarceration's Impact on Black and Latino Women and Children, led by the Executive Director of the Correctional Association. Um, and she and her team will discuss incarceration with particular focus on juvenile justice and women's reproductive health rights. Uh, finally, on April 3rd, there will be a screening of the film Crime After Crime, which is the true story of the battle to free Deborah Peebler, a wrongly incarcerated survivor of domestic violence and the fight against a corrupt criminal justice system stacked against battered women. And two of the attorneys who fought on her case will be here for discussion post screening. Um, so I hope you come for all of those programs. Also this spring we have um, the wonderful celebration of Judy Chicago's 75th birthday. Um, there are events taking place all over the country, but here um, we have an exhibition opening in April, on April 4th, called Chicago and LA, Early Judy Chicago, 1963 to 1974. And prior to April 4th, uh, on March 9th, Judy and Elizabeth will be in conversation here in the auditorium discussing um, their, their ongoing um, work to make institutional change. Um, so I hope you will all come here for that. And finally, this is the last announcement about things that are happening here at the Sackler Center. Um, on June 5th, we will be honoring Anita Hill with the Sackler Center First Awards, which is very exciting for all of us here. Um, we are giving her the award for Speaking Truth to Power, and she will be here that day. We'll be screening her new film, uh, it's a new documentary about her called Anita. And um, if you're not familiar with the Sackler Center First Awards, there's sort of a giant description in the back of the forum, but you can read about all of the um, remarkable and trailblazing women we have honored. And now on to another remarkable and trailblazing woman, Barbara Nesson. Um, Elizabeth Sackler couldn't be here today, but she wanted me to make sure everyone knows how pleased she is you're here today, Thank you. Barbara, to speak in the um, center, in the Sackler Center. And I can't think of a more appropriate place for you to be than here at the Center for Feminist Art, the only one of its kind in the world. Barbara Nesson is an internationally recognized studio artist, illustrator, and educator. Her distinctive signature avant-garde style has not only placed her art on the covers of Time, Rolling Stone, The New York Times, and other major publications. It also landed her a solo retrospective exhibition at the Victoria Out, excuse me, 
me, the Victoria and Albert Museum in the spring of 2013. After receiving her education at Pratt in the Department of Illustration and Fine Art, she was quickly recognized for the freshness and uniqueness of her work and for being one of the two female freelance illustrators yeah. at the time. Barbara is also known for being one of the first artists to embrace the use of the computer as a creative tool. Never short of inspiration, she attributes the ongoing creativity in her work to her foundation as a fine artist and relies solely upon her earlier sketchbooks to generate new ideas. Her paintings and drawings in her distinctive signature style have not only donned the walls of prominent museums and galleries, but have been part of numerous, and public, numerous public and private collections around the globe including the Victorian Albert Museum in London, the Smithsonian Institute in Washington, D.C., the Norman Rockwell Museum in Stockbridge, Massachusetts, the Kunsthalle Museum in Dusseldorf, and the Louvre in Paris, only to name a few. Today, Barbara's main focus is her large-scale work on several commissions for public spaces in New York City buildings, most recently the Eventi Hotel in Manhattan's North Chelsea neighborhood. Bigger insight into Barbara's life and work can be gained from her recent monograph, Barbara Nissim, An Artful Life, published by Abrams in 2013. And if you haven't read it, I highly recommend it. I have a copy at my house, and I have thoroughly enjoyed reading it. So um, I think that's enough of me. Let's hand it off to Barbara. with everybody here, so I thank you all for coming and joining me in this, uh, at the Brooklyn Museum, because I'm honored to be here, and uh, thank you. <laughs> so without further ado, I'm going to go through my slides, and basically <clears throat> it's, it's a history of everything from the early 60s to up until now and just showing you my old studio and my new studio <clears throat> in, that I moved into five years ago. Working with uh, women and how they relate to uh, the world. These are early paintings. And basically, I always had a, an issue with how women were treated in early times, like the 60s. <laughs> Not so early. Moving along to watercolors, and I always had to put a line of type underneath it to explain what I was doing. And it was part, I feel that the type at the bottom, the words were part of the art. And I, maybe I did about 100 of these. And that was in 67. Very simple, very direct. And Ms. Magazine, when it first came out, I did uh, this piece. I think it's in the first issue, Women in Madness. And the work that I do for myself always influences the work that I do for publication. So being an illustrator is part of being an artist, but first I'm an artist and my illustration is influenced by my own work. And that is what I was doing at the same time that I was doing that piece for Women in Madness. And of course, there are many, many more in this venue. Then I started doing the Woman Girl series because I always thought that women have to show, have to do a million things and then just look like nothing has ever happened, that they don't have to, you know, that they should be all dressed up and, look, you know, looking like women. <laughs> <laughs> and so she's on her toe shoes, making it very, seem very simple, <laughs> but her hands are disconnected from her body because she has no control, really. But she's out there, <laughs> and she's enjoying it. And all other things are out there, too. You have to look. <laughs> so the whole Woman Girl series, I wasn't allowed to show in any gallery because it had... Uh, an exposed pubic area. <laughs> so 
sort of like a chastity belt that you could get into. <laughs> and there's probably a hundred pieces in this over the years, I mean over the, this uh, period. And I love shoes. I think <laughs> shoes. I think shoes are just so fantastic. And I did tons of great, beautiful shoes, fantasy shoes. And one day somebody calls me up and said, do you want to design shoes? And I said, wow, I never did that before, but yeah, why not? So I went to Italy and I designed shoes for a, a year. And that was interesting. Not, I wasn't in Italy for a year, but I, it was a year that I, I had that job. And this is another example of how my work influence, my own work influences work that I do for publication. This was a mock cover for the first issue, reissue of Vanity Fair. They never used it, they used some other artists, but they asked about 10 artists to do something and this is what I did. And then again, a Japanese company asked me to do a calendar for March and I was happy to be influenced by that here. You have a double heel because if you, oh, it's for the Hotel Barmen Association. And I always think, well, if you go to a bar and you have too much to drink and you might see two <laughs> heels on, the sh on your shoes. So basically, this is a, my shoes viewed by someone a little drunk. <laughs> And then also a bar has like curtains because it's very theatrical and it's night so the moon is coming through the <laughs> sky and we're having a good time. And these are my, this is in my new studio and these are my sketchbooks, they're too deep. If I pull that out you'll see a whole bunch more in the back. And to date I have 93. I brought some here to show you uh, and also I use lulu.com to publish them. So they are published on the web if you want to search for it or, or you go to Lulu and you can buy one but I don't make it really public. It's, it's just I put it out there for myself and if anybody is lucky enough to happen upon it they can buy one. But I number them all and, uh, and date them all. And I have rules for my sketchbooks. I have to do a first page and I have to do a last page. And I'm not allowed to tear any pages out. Because if I did something that I don't like too bad, I have to see it. Because it's just like if you said something that you shouldn't have said, it's out there. So I see everything and I don't want to hide it from myself. And the funny thing is, is sometimes I look at it later and I think, oh, I like this. I don't know why I didn't like it. And these last pieces were influenced, the, done, be, done before, influenced something that I did for Mademoiselle. And um, I, I used these and I did them for Paula and there's Mary Lou who, were you working there yeah, then? Yeah, yeah. yeah okay. <laughs> And um, I was just so glad that somebody saw the, they said, oh, we would love to have that style for our uh, magazine, but don't do a red face, do a normal <laughs> face. So I said, no problem, I'm very happy to do it. And then my piece came, this particular piece was on the cover of LA Style and they wanted to do dining and, and um, living in LA. So I always think of LA, this is in the 80s, I think, yeah. And I always thought of LA, you know, oh, it's all movie stars and things of that nature. So here is a woman, she's having lunch by the pool, but she has the blue plate special on her hat. <laughs> and she doesn't even know. <laughs> so when this was done for American Illustration, they had an advertising to sell it. And so I cut out the little advertising and I did a drawing of me reading it and having a drink in LA. That's hard to see but that's a, a, a drawing from life done with a pen and just no pencil just just drawing right this is on a train I love drawing from life and I love just doing putting the pen to paper and just drawing and and actually looking at what 
I see and making it realistic. It's very meditative. Obscene phone call. <laughs> <laughs> Have you gotten one lately? And uh, the Eames chair, they called me up and they said, we'd like you to do a portrait of the Eames chair. And I said, fine, that's great. I'd <laughs> love to do, do that. So they sent me the Eames chair and there it was sitting in my living room. And I'm thinking, okay, let me start drawing. And then I thought, well, this is one time where my, sketch, my sketchbook, I'm gonna, inf I'm, I'm gonna do it with my sketchbook first. I know that they're not gonna use this, but then I can do something else. So of course I had her smoking and sitting in the chair. I don't smoke, but I thought she should be smoking in that chair. And this is what I finally did. So she was transparent, but still she, it was the portrait. And this is all about reproduction. How much time do I have to have a baby? I don't want a baby, but <laughs> this way. <laughs> This is what women were thinking about, you know, it's, if you're a man, you don't have to think about that, but if you're a woman, you have to think about when should I get married because I, I want to have children. So there's the eggs, there's the clock. <laughs> and then I used it for Newsweek magazine as an illustration because they had needed, uh, they did a story on uh, exactly what I'm talking about. And I did three pages plus a, a a big front page. And this is when people think that satin sheets are sexy. So if you had a man in bed with satin sheets, he would slip right out. <laughs> Very slippery. Time magazine asked me to do, asked seven people to do a possible cover for uh, the woman's movement. It was in, I think, 10 year anniversary. And uh, I decided to put the woman in the dark because she was still in the dark. She was climbing those big steps to get to the blue sky. And the white part was black and white and every color in between for every woman. It wasn't just one kind of woman. And she was going to climb to the blue sky. But when, in the beginning, the ERA was just going to uh, um, Congress to pass, and it was defeated. So I had her up at three to the third step at the top. And then when it was defeated, I put her back down to the bottom. So she's standing now on the hill of her shoulder. And she said, I added the hair as the they're not tears exactly, she said, but she's not angry. She's going to climb those stairs and get to the blue sky. <laughs> and somebody wrote in saying it shouldn't be climb to equality, it should be climb to equity. And I thought, oh, that's good. <laughs> and in 1980, I was asked to go to MIT to work on computers to learn how to use computers. And I thought, oh, that sounds interesting. Computers can make art. I thought, how does that work? And two years later, I never went to MIT because I couldn't figure out how to teach and go up to Boston because I knew it was going to be more than just a week. I'm not going to learn how to use a computer because I don't even know what it is to make art in a week. So I thought, I need time for this and it will take maybe a month or two and if you're teaching, you need to be at school every Wednesday. So I started looking for a computer in New York two years before I found one. And Time Incorporated invited me to use theirs. And this is all the luxury of color and form that I had to work with. Green, yellow, red, blue. Six colors and uh, black and white and gray, six colors of gray. And I had some patterns, I could fill it or not fill it. And I went up there, I was allowed to work, I was their artist in residence, and I was allowed to work um, at five o'clock in the afternoon to nine o'clock the next morning. So I would go up every day at five o'clock, read the book, and I did a whole bunch of work. 
And then at the last day when they were closing, it was about two years, I was there a year, but it was two years, they told me they were shutting down. So at the end of this presentation, you will see a video that I did the last night that I was there. And um, it, it was, we were there the whole night with this guy, Steve Forbes, and he helped me do it and put it together. I didn't know I could even do a video. A show that I had in Japan, and that's the work that came out of working at Time. And that's a NEC PC100 computer in 1986. And Japan was just starting to get into it. And I would be there working while people came into the place and visited and saw my show. And these are the pieces that came out of that experience there, but they were not archival color. They, they faded as, like, as soon as you put it out to the light and a week later they would fade. So I was only interested in working with things with archival, something that was archival. But it was much more advanced than what I had been working with. And still about men and women and how their relationships are. And these are very large Ciba chromes. And then Amiga, Commodore Amiga heard I was interested in working with computers, so they gave me an Amiga computer which no longer exists. So I learned that computer. And it, uh, the Polaroid uh, was their output. And I thought, okay, I take 72 drawings that I input with a, a mouse, and then I would um, make flags because I was interested in migration, immigration, integration, and then population growth. And these are some of the individual ones. But it's the same 72 drawings. And that just shows people could be everywhere and anywhere, the same thing. And they're just doing everyday things. So from far you see that it's a flag and people, and you have a preconceived idea of what uh, sw Swedish lives are like. But when you get to know somebody from Sweden, you don't have that preconceived idea anymore. They're just people like you and me. And this is pieced together, these are large pieces, each one of those little pieces are uh, eight and a half by 11, and because the, um, the other prints that I was doing was not archival, I decided to hand color them with pastel, and they still look great. And the Victoria and Albert Museum owns this one. And somebody, this artist, Rayford John, Ray, not Rayford, Ray Johnson called me one day and he said, Barbara, what's your favorite word? And I had to think, what's my favorite word? What's your favorite word? And I thought, hmm, I think hello. Because hello is something that you say when you first meet somebody. So I thought, okay, that's my favorite word. And then I decided to make an artwork out of it. This is a, the first show I had in Soho. Actually, it was the second, but the first big show I had at Rempire Gallery in 1991. And I think it, it was one of the first in, where somebody could do an interactive art piece where people could come up and make little books, much like the ones, the American flag that I showed you before, but now you could take something away with you. And these are much larger on this. Uh, this is 200 drawings now. <clears throat> on the American flag in the back, and you can, um, uh, they're eight and a half by five and a half feet. And so people could come up, they could choose a flag, and from that flag was the cover of their book, but it randomly accessed out of 200 drawings the, uh, the, what the content of the book, so no two books were the same, the chances of getting the same book twice was 48 million to one. Like Lotto was six million to one, so you, you just couldn't get it twice. And I was, that was the laser printer that I had, the Mac Plus, I turned it on the side. 
Uh, I had a, a cutter that you wouldn't hurt yourself with. And then I had uh, um, uh, information on how you could make the book. And I had a librarian come in to the show, and she was so excited that she made a book. She goes, I never knew you could, I never knew how you could make books. And so, you know, there was, it was very, very popular, and everybody would come back and be keeping on making books. And in the same show, I had uh, stereo pair, 3D stereo pair, <clears throat> which you could do with the computer because you could make your picture, you could copy it exactly, and then you could move, isolate forms and move them front and back, and you could see whether it comes, if you cross your eyes, you could see whether what's coming forward, what's coming backward. And so I could see what the stereo pair would look like before I even made the picture. And that was a lot of fun. And you could see the difference between where the spiral is and the, to the body. You could see how far apart it is on this side and how close it is on the other side. So they're, they're similar but not the same. Same with this. And these are the books that came out from the earlier piece that I talked about. And I happened to find that color pre-colored pre-printed colored paper, which I was very lucky about, so that you still had something interesting. It wasn't just a white piece of paper. And this is how it unfolded when it was folded. And the same 200 drawings that were in that program for the book, and I called it Random Access Memory, RAM, are in these larger flags. And every time I had done uh, how to show or did something new, I always had to invent, how am I going to show it? It's one thing when you're working in a computer to, <clears throat> to see it there, because you have, if you're working on paper, then the paper is it, that's it. But you're working on the computer, you finish it on the computer, and then you have to get it out. Well, how does it come out of there? What, what form does it take? So I've managed to figure out many, 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 many different forms that the art could take place. And uh, so each one is an invention. And here, each corner has um, magnets on the back. I found this paper steel strips so that it, you can uh, put it on the wall just like that. It's magnetic. And the paper steel goes into the wall with uh, um, a stapler. And then I don't do portraits very, I, I'm not a really good portrait artist, and I always find it hard to get a likeness. So when Rolling Stone asked me to do this cover of John Lennon on his eighth, eighth year anniversary of his death, I thought, oh my God, I don't know. I said, I'm, I don't really do portraits that well, so how's it bad if I do something? You, I have a week, I'll do it in three days, and if you don't like it, it doesn't come out, then you can give it to somebody else. <laughs> so I wanted to make sure that they weren't stuck with something. And then I started working and working, and, and I, I had to find all different pictures because I had to make him look older than what he was when he passed away. And so then I came up with this one, and I wasn't sure whether it looked like my daughter's boyfriend, Billy, who looked a lot <laughs> like John Lennon, so, and I didn't never saw that before, or it was looked like John Lennon. So I went into the next office and I held it up and I said, who is this? <laughs> they said, John Lennon. Good. <laughs> I was so happy. And so they liked it and, oh, and Yoko Ono had to approve it. So and she liked it, so I was lucky. And I like it too. <laughs> so I'm always surprising myself if I can do something like that. And <clears throat> Levi's asked me to do a portrait of jeans. That I could do. And these were big billboards all over the country. Like that. <laughs> and then I would go to Times Square and look at it and I think, my God, they did such a great job in painting it. I mean, <laughs> they, I mean it looks exactly like my work. And I thought, oh, this is really good. And then 
I was asked to do breast cancer in uh, young women for the New York Times cover, and I thought, oh my goodness, how, how am I, what am I going to do? And so I just thought something really simple, but whatever it was, I wasn't allowed to show the nipple. And I thought, hmm, <laughs> how do you do breasts without showing the nipple? So I did it like that, and I brought it in, and they said, <gasps> the nipple. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, why don't you just show it to somebody and see if that's going to be a problem? They loved it. Oh, I was so happy. And I did, this is my 50-50 job. I did the drawing. I must have done about 100 breasts, because, you know, it's 35. The breast isn't too up. It's not too down. It's like 50. <laughs> and, and what's a 35-year-old breast look like exactly? The lip, the thing. Mm. So, and then in all color, I made the uh, um, rainbow color, because it was every woman. And this, this is another show that I had, uh, picture in picture, I call this. And I took one of the pictures from that. Now I had 400 in the database. And I would blow up, I would print out the, uh, the, the each one is one picture. And then I would take that 16 pieces, put them in the printer again, and make one big picture and print it over. And that was the piece. So within all of us, the big picture, there's all these little pictures. Like we, like us. We are so many different people, even if we're one person. And then I decided to make my own flags. Because in, in you know, people live under, live under a flag. So you're, you're under a nation. And so I decided to create my own, my own nations. Taking the American flag and scanning it in, show that I had it bit forms, black truths, white lies. I remember lying in bed and thinking, hmm, what's a white lie? Maybe there's something called a black truth. This is what I think about when I'm <laughs> sleeping. <laughs> A black truth, hmm, what would be a black truth? And what would be a white lie? And how would that go together? And so then I thought, OK, I'm going to start doing some work on that. When I got to the studio and worked just in black and white. And one, one part I have is an abstract, and the other part was a figure drawing. So that, because I think that there's so much abstractness in each one of us, and there's so much abstractness in how we communicate to each other and how much we want to tell people about each uh, us. So this sort of like truth, sort of truth, almost truth, sort of. <laughs> so that's the abstract part and the figurative part. And then I took the abstract part and made them separate, and I called them love letters. Because between two people, you're writing letters, but you know how much you're saying, even though the words are just normal words like, I love you. But that I love you could mean a million different things. And it's so abstract, the word love. So these are my love letters to you. <laughs> and my sketchbooks are really important to my work. It's pretty much paramount. And these are pieces from my sketchbook and was influenced by that. My first commission to do a large scale piece for a uh, building in, in uh, the West Village. And so it was about oh, people entering buildings, entering their home, being, being sitting down in their house, going through doorways, the houses at the bottom, just all little vignettes of how it is when you're uh, entering your home and you're in your sanctuary. And this was for Centria, which is uh, a building that's right across the street from Rockefeller Center. And I thought, well, I'll take the Christmas tree and do something with that. And so there's the Madonna. 
and she has her hand protecting the baby Jesus that you don't see, but you know is there. Those are the three wise men at the bottom, <laughs> kind of looking around, like where is, where is the Jesus baby? And then, and of course they're, they're kind of, even though they're wise men, they're kind of small because she's, Madonna is really big. And that's coming from the sea form and then industry and then trees. So it's a, sort of the earth. And then on the right hand side is the Christmas tree, the cone shape with the top flying off. And there's a person sitting in reverence to the whole idea of Christmas. And those shapes are like the constellation of stars, but my idea of the constellation of stars. And then they were going to put a vending machine in this place. And all of a sudden they said, Barbara, could you do something? for the mail room. And I thought, oh, the mail room? What, like when? Like tomorrow? And I said, oh, oh. <laughs> well, <laughs> maybe. So I thought, all right, let me see. What's about mail? What's about communication? So then I started writing down all the words that I could think about uh, that had something to do with communication. Then I went to the dictionary, and I just opened the dictionary and pointed to a word and wrote it down. Opened the dictionary, pointed to the word, and kept on going, and I had these lists of words. And then I gave it to my assistant, and I said, okay, pick out all the words that have to do with communication that you think, and her name is Holly. And so it's gray matter, um, whatever, personal number, which is your uh, address, conduit of luck, I think that's, yeah, could be, you could have won lotto, you know, could open the thing and say, ooh, lotto. Uh, <laughs> comfort corner, you sit in the, in the corner and read a letter. And then it could be divisive. And then tomorrow, it's new. So <laughs> you open the mailbox, it's new, new words. And then I moved into my studio. And a friend of mine, Carl, who's here somewhere, uh, Carl Rudiso, who's a photographer, came in and goes, I love this place. It's so, the light, it's great. It's like a light bulb. I want to, uh, I want to uh, shoot here. And I said, oh, I don't know. I <laughs> wasn't sure. And so after about three or four months, I said, okay. And he got the model and a makeup artist and hair artist and everybody. And then I decided to do these large pieces that I had done for another uh, show years and years ago. And these are pretty big. They're eight feet by four feet. And then I cut them up and I thought, let me do something else with it. And then after the shoot, Carl showed me his photographs. And then I asked him if I could work on them to do uh, collages on them. And I, it, this became the model project. And they're printed on aluminum at Dugal, where Carl was actually now working. And uh, he sort of shepherded, shepherded the whole thing through, and they really look beautiful on these um, aluminum big boards, big pieces. And so then after working with his photographs, I thought, I got another job to do to, um, for a hotel called the Eventi, and that was being built. And I had this huge piece to do, and it was built as a classic hotel. And I thought, well, what's a classic hotel? It's, um, you know, what's classic? What's classic? So I went to the Met, and I decided to photograph all the Greek and Roman sculptures. And then I took them back home, and I started working with them. And, and these, this is what came out. The, so they are just the Greek and Roman sculptures with my collage on it, and the background of all folded Greek and Roman statues, photographs of them. And these are also printed on aluminum, and they were done at Dugal. And there it is, it's something abstract and something uh, figurative. And that's something that I realized that I do, but I wasn't aware that I do it. Abstract and figurative in the same plane. And the show at the Victoria and Albert Museum, 
which happened uh, a year ago this time. And I was thrilled and more than thrilled to be there. And they took the whole show into their permanent collection. So everything from 1960s to up until the portrait that I did for David Bowie, because uh, they had an exhibition on his, and, the, and for the V&A magazine, are in their collection. Plus the ceramic shoes that I did. And there's two portraits that are there. David Bowie then, David Bowie now. And collages in my sketchbook that I did now. So these are all of the moment. And that's the last one of this group. And now I'm going to show you a five minute video of the computer work that I did in 1983. And this is something that we com completed 15 minutes of video in one night. And then I took it and I edited it and went to an editing suite and put music to it and everything else. But that's what you'll be looking at now.
you. Thank you so much for coming, and um, I'm here to answer any questions that you have about the work. Yeah, Katie. Hi. Um, I have a question about your process with the model project. The process with the yeah. model project. So you cut things out that interest you and then arrange them, or do you have a pre- Pardon me? Do you, do you cut things first and then play with them, or do you have a- Oh no, I, I never have an idea of what I'm doing. <laughs> no, really. I, it just like, okay, I don't want to worry about uh, doing something. Uh, I, I, I just want to, um, I thought, okay, I have, a, I have a vague idea of what I want. Um, so it's not preconceived. So I have the, uh, when I saw his photographs, well, I just thought it was going to be those big, long big things that I did and then when I saw Carl's photographs he's here somewhere and I thought oh maybe I could do something so I asked permission if I could do something with his photographs and he said yeah he, fine so I took whatever he had and I just started cutting and doing and I've always done collages but not, in, not as a main thing not a whole body of work I always like to do it in, I have one book in the 80s that I did, Cut It Out, that was the name of it, and I did lots of collages within that. Uh, but basically, I, uh, I don't really do collages and, until now. And so I, I, I said one, I like, oh, I like that. I did another one, oh, this is, a, but finally I had a body of work. I had nine pieces on those photographs, and then I showed him, and he said, well, I'm working at De Gaulle now, come on in, and we'll see, because I was going to print them on canvas. And then he showed me that we, we did like six different or five different uh, tests, one on aluminum, one on canvas, one on kind of a, uh, a woven substance, one on a plastic substance, all, all different things. And when I saw it on the aluminum, I thought, perfect, because it's all about the model and aluminum and you know jewelry and shiny and <laughs> all of that so it was perfect and then Carl worked you know because it was the printer I didn't have I'm, I'm not a printer and that, neither is Carl he's a photographer a wonderful photographer but I thought well I think that I should uh, I was going to do it there and then he shepherded it through and made sure it was great and thank you, Carl, for making sure it was great. I appreciate it. So that's the process. And, and, and they're just this big, you know, as big as photographs, but I saw them as big. And uh, the Victoria and Albert has the originals of the smaller ones, plus they have one big one. So I'm happy that they'll be taken care of because, you know, a, a museum will take care of the work. <laughs> I can take care of the work, but I don't know who's going to take care of the work after. So at least I know from 1960 to 2013, a whole body of work and range will be taken care of at that museum in London. And I can visit it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Nancy. I, I've never, I've known about your work for years and years and years, and it was like sort of touching an elephant here, here, here. And it never occurred to me that in the context of doing a commission, which I think of as <gasps> of tightness, and that you could be so playful and so amazing. It's like you could trust yourself. And it, all those sketchbooks are like, yeah, it comes like that. Yeah. It's like breathing and living for you and playing, playing, play, play. You know, who would dare to touch a computer? When I first saw those computer pieces, I thought, Oh no, you can't make a line like this. You have to make dip, 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 dip. There it is. Yeah. Play with it, play. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I know. I know that was hard to hear for you in the back, but basically she just was wondering, you know, how I could do something so small and then take on larger pieces uh, for. No, for it was the concept that you trust yourself with the concept. It not, has nothing to do with size. Oh. Because the concept of working from drawing to computer. No, it has to do with the play. I didn't understand <laughs> anything. I'm glad I liked that. It has to do with the ease and the playfulness. The so ease and the trust, playfulness. You trust your subconscious or your, you know, that you can you, trust yourself to do anything, actually. Yeah. That's really how others saw it, really. Yeah. 
Well, that's the, well, that's what I think. I mean, <laughs> give me some rocks and dirt and whatever, right. and I'll say, okay, I can make art out of that. Okay, I'll make art out of this. Okay, <laughs> you know, I I, I just it's I, I really like to work with anything. Yeah. It's really demonstrable. And yeah. it's, it's well, inspiring. thank you, yeah. thank you. I'm glad I asked. I'm glad I told you. Because <laughs> now I understand what you said. Yes. What is next? What's next? What's next? <laughs> <laughs> you think I know? <laughs> no, I'm the last to know. <laughs> it just I sit on my drawing table and it happens. You know, I have some ideas, you know, just going. Yeah. Barbara, when you started doing the digital art, there were the stair step edges of the art, and then technology advanced, and you, in many cases, you retained the stair step. It was a conscious choice to retain the stair step idea as opposed to smoothing it out and to retain. What, what was your thinking about using the same stair step angles on modern art? You mean with the with resolution, the yes. low resolution right. of the computer? Well, that's what I had. You know. I, but then you got modern, and then you. Yeah, I no, it's just like, okay, this is it. All right, now, what am I going to do with this is it? So, you know, for me, I take anything, all right, show me what my boundaries are, and I will make something out of it, but I want to understand what it is. I had no idea what the computer was, could do. When, when the guy at MIT called me to work on the computer, and I said, are you kidding? <laughs> you know, I thought the computer was for AT&T. Not for me, and uh, so and it t took me two years to find one in New York, and when it was so stair stepping because it was t um, 199 by 256, that was the resolution. Not very much, <laughs> believe me, not very much. And I only had six colors, a set of six grays, and black and white, and and some patterns, ooh, <laughs> you know, <laughs> wow, they gave me whipped cream. Uh, but I, I just felt like, okay, let's see what I can make with this. Uh, that was the challenge. And also, I tried to get my friends to come up with me. Uh, you know, first of all, I wasn't allowed to tell anybody what I was doing, it was a secret. Uh, not that what, what I was doing was a secret, but what they were doing was a secret. So I had to, uh, when I get, went up there at night and, you know, it was like I couldn't say anything. Then I had to beg to, could I have some friends, because this big, big room, like five times as big as this room, and remember me sitting in one of the desks working all by myself in this big room and all the other computers around. I'm thinking, well, I, I, I'd like to have some friends here. <laughs> you know, it was like, really? And late at night. So I asked, I kind of begged, do you think that I could ask some of my friends, I'll teach them, but to come up and work with the computer? Well, I never realized how reactionary, when I would say I'm working with the computer and I'll teach you and you'll come up and, no, 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 computer, no, 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 no. I mean, like it was like, I couldn't believe it. I couldn't get one person to come up and be with me. <laughs> Not one person. So I, I thought, well, am I crazy or what? <laughs> am I the only artist that really wants to work with a computer or, or to experiment? So, you know, it wasn't, very, it wasn't very easy to work with in the beginning, but I made it work because if that's all I had, that was all I had. So I have $5, I'm going to, that's what I have, $5, and I'm going to make that into the biggest $5 that I can make it into. So, anybody else? <laughs> Any other questions? Do you, yes. have a, do you have a favorite media, and if so, why? Do I have a favorite media, and why? Actually, I, the only thing I've never worked in is uh, wax encaustic. And if anybody here wants to teach me, I'll be glad to come <laughs> over <laughs> and work with, work with you and learn it. But um, I don't have a favorite medium. I think that working in all different media is uh, interesting to explore. And, you know, of course, in my sketchbooks, I work with pen and watercolor because 
or collage that's, you know, the size and it's just easy to transport. But I've worked in oil, I've worked in, oh, acrylic. When I started using acrylic, the same thing happened in the 60s. Uh, and yeah, the 60s. Acry acrylic just came into being. It was called Liquitex yeah. or uh, something like that. And Utrecht so sold these big jars and I went and got them plastic paint. People didn't like plastic paint at all. Plastic paint, oil paint, not plastic paint. But, so I worked in acrylic for five years, I worked in oil for five years. Like, I'll work in a medium till I feel like I've, I've done it and then I'll move on to something else until I feel like I've done it. Etching, I love etching and lithography and just all different ways to explore. So I like all mediums. And I didn't even know that I was, uh, uh, with the sketchbooks, I started doing sketchbooks in 1960. I didn't realize that that was a practice that I did until <laughs> probably 15 years later. And then when I realized that was something I actually did, then I went and made real good sketchbooks with very good paper and I had a, this uh, bookmaker make them for me. But I, I, I do things and then I realize what I'm doing. That's why you, when somebody asks me what's next, I don't know, you know, because I don't know what I'm really doing. I just trust myself to do it. Where were you born and did you have formal art training as a child? Where was I born? <laughs> <laughs> the Bronx. <laughs> and I love the Bronx. <laughs> That's what I tell people when I get up. I mean, I have a Bronx accent. There it is. So, um, and that's it. I can't be anything else. But I was always very happy to be born in the Bronx, and I was very happy to be born in New York. And when I was 14, I remember getting down on my hands and knees and praying to God, saying, Dear God, thank you so much for <laughs> letting me be born in New York. <laughs> because I somehow knew that was important. <laughs> and then what was the second question? <laughs> art training, did you have art training? I did, I went to the High School of Art and Design, <clears throat> and then, which was called Industrial Art when I went there, uh, and it was 1956 to 1960. And uh, then I went to Pratt, but before that I had an art teacher, Mrs. Salmonetti, in the ninth grade, who uh, said, you're gonna go to industrial art and then you're gonna go to Pratt. <laughs> and that's exactly what I did because she was my art teacher and she told me where my, what my future was gonna be and I didn't, I didn't even know there was music and art. And, I, and Pratt was just like, I just thought that was the only art school. So I applied there and I got in. I was lucky because I didn't apply to anything, any place else. <laughs> so that's, that's where I'm, I'm so glad I'm born in New York. <laughs> Anybody else? So now you know all about me. <laughs> Thank you. everyone for coming out and supporting this event and supporting this museum. I'm, I'm very honored to be here and uh, you know um, words can't say how pleased I am and, and I thank you all for making the effort and it didn't snow. <laughs> very lucky. Thank you. Thank you.